Good afternoon and good evening. Thank you all for finding time and joining today's APHRS Cardiac Device Rhythm Device uh, Therapy Webinar. My name is Jeremy Yu. I'm the Regional Education Manager at Abbott Medical. It is my pleasure to be a moderator for today's session, Understanding ECGs and Intracardiac Electrograms in Device Therapy, Part 1. Today, we got a great opportunity to have three experienced speakers, including Dr. Kevin Wong, Dr. Tun Wei Lim from Singapore, and we also have Dr. Harry Mond from Australia. They will share their knowledge in interpreting a bradycardia and pacemaker ECG. If you have any questions wanted to ask our speakers, please write them into the chat box of your, um, in your control panel. We will have time for Q&A after each presentation. And when you see the polling questions on your device along the presentation, please respond with your answer. So now I would like to invite Dr. Harry Mond, our chairperson of today, to give an opening speech. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Jeremy. Welcome everybody this afternoon or evening, wherever you are in Asia. For the record, today is the 18th of June, 2020. I believe we have a huge Zoom audience of over 400 registrants and, my, and already over 200 of those are online. I am absolutely delighted to be your chairman and speaker today. I always enjoy talking in Asia because I believe they are the best audiences in the world. Today's Asian Pacific Heart Rhythm Society meeting is co-sponsored by Abbott Education Network. This is a webinar series on cardiac rhythm device therapy, and this is part one, understanding ECGs in pacing therapy. In a short period of only a very few months, the whole concept of medical education and symposia has completely changed. And although we thought that such web meetings may only be temporary, I believe they are here to stay and will grow enormously in the future. Today, we have three speakers, Dr. Kelvin Wong, uh, Dr. Toon Wei Lim, and myself. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Kelvin Wong. Kelvin did his training in the United Kingdom and is currently an electrophysiologist at the Mount Elizabeth Hospital in Singapore. His topic will be basic ECGs for bradycardia. Kelvin. Thank you, Harry. Uh, welcome, everybody. So I'm going to kick off the uh, first talk, uh, talking about basic ECG for bradycardia. Uh, before I start, I'd like to pay a, a short tribute to Professor Hein Wellens, uh, who, uh, on his passing last week, uh, he's certainly a, a great pioneer of cardiology and um, electrophysiology, and I've been blessed by his teaching. So uh, to kick it off, so uh, bradycardia uh, usually is a result of conduction abnormality, uh, which can happen uh, anywhere in the conduction system. And broadly speaking, we can divide them into SA nodal disease, uh, AV nodal disease, or conduction abnormalities uh, affecting the more distal bundles. And this is my approach to uh, making a diagnosis for bradycardia. The diagnosis is usually made on ECG or some form of ECG recording. Uh, and after making the diagnosis, then you make a, a decision uh, assessment as uh, whether this arrhythmia is uh, reversible. Yeah. The underlying cause uh, for the bradycardia. And if you don't find anything, then uh, we also try and look for uh, red flags uh, such as uh, symptoms of uh, recurrent syncope, 
certain ECG features or the underlying conditions which may suggest uh, an paroxysmal bradycardia. And there are several causes. In general, uh, the extrinsic causes are the ones that are reversible, such as uh, due to uh, medications or due to metabolic or electrolyte imbalances. Uh, and of course, there is the uh, vagal innervation of the heart. The intrinsic causes are many. Uh, most of the time, it is due to idiopathic degeneration. But there are other, there's a long list of uh, causes, including iatrogenic, uh, ischemic heart disease infective. Uh, but I would like to just draw your attention to two uh, rarer causes, such as infiltrative disease and uh, the neuromuscular disease, which may affect, uh, the, which may have more specific uh, management strategies. So just to go through the basic concept uh, of uh, heart block. So as I mentioned before, the conduction disease can happen in any part of the electrical system. And in general, if you look at the uh, top right hand corner, there's a pacemaker hierarchy, where the SA node is usually the driver. Uh, however, when you have conduction block, the uh, conduction system distal to the block then takes over uh, as a subsidiary or escape pacemaker. And uh, as you go further distal in the conduction system, then the heart rate reduces uh, and the, uh, st the stability is also impaired. And if you have a, uh, a narrow QRS escape, that suggests the, that the escape uh, pacemaker is originating from the AV node or his bundle, and a broad complex will uh, suggest that the original uh, that the escape pacemaker is from the ventricles or the distal Purkinje system. So this is my approach to the ECG. Uh, so I hope uh, you do not get distracted by the ST elevation. Uh, because in here, we're not really concerned about the ST elevation. We are, but uh, for the purpose of bradycardia and heart block, I'd like you to focus on uh, first determining the QRS. So we can see that uh, these are the QRSs. They are regular and slow, uh, and it's sort of a narrow uh, QRS. Then we look for the obvious P waves, and we can track them through. Okay, uh, but uh, we can see that some of them are sort of hidden either within the QRS or the P waves. Okay, and then finally, we can look at how the atrial, the P wave and the QRS are, are related. And we can see here that there's no correlation. Uh, so there is a, in this case, we, have, we can make a diagnosis of complete heart block with a narrow QRS uh, escape. Uh, it's also important to look at what happens before and after. So if we have telemetry, we can look at the onset and termination, if this is a paroxysmal one. The baseline ECG sometimes give clues if there's underlying conduction block. And of course, if there were uh, underlying neuromuscular disease or sarcoidosis, that can uh, help us. And I will also talk about some extra tests may, which may be helpful in assessing the site of AV block. So I'm going to start uh, with AV block because I think that's the more important block. Uh, so uh, traditionally, this uh, divided into first degree, second degree, and third degree, uh, which I will go through uh, later. Uh, but this is uh, essentially an ECG diagnosis. Uh, there are other uh, useful things such as um, vaguely mediated atrial ventricular block and in front of the block, which again, I'll come to in a later slide. So uh, this, as I uh, explained before, the, by classifying it into first, second, and third degree block, it's an ECG diagnosis. However, uh, we, can, we, can, we may not be certain as to the site of the block. As you can see in this picture, uh, in, in the AV node, uh, you can see that it can result in, in all three kinds of block, first, second, and third degree. And again, in the HIS, uh, all three kinds of block can be present. So uh, the fact is making a diagnosis of first, second, and third degree AV block uh, 
uh, is the first step, but we need to go on to determine uh, where is the site of block. And to do this, we can use ECG features to help us. We can use certain maneuvers, uh, usually non-invasive maneuvers that can help us, or we can also do invasive EPS. So in this case, at the bottom, you can see the atrial EGM, the His EGM, and the ventricular EGM, and you can measure the AHHV intervals, which can help. So uh, let's uh, let's go on. So the first degree heart block uh, is a misnomer. There is no block in uh, into the V. Every P wave is conducted. There's a prolonged PR interval defined as more than 200 milliseconds. However, as I mentioned before, uh, the conduction block can actually be anywhere within the conduction system. However, if you have a very prolonged PR interval of more than 280 milliseconds, then it's more likely to be there in the AV nodes. And in fact, infranodal uh, delay generally gives you a fairly normal or only slightly prolonged PR interval. Okay, the second degree heart block is divided into two. The first one is the Mobitz one, also known as Spanky Bar. And you can see here that there is gradual lengthening of the PR interval, okay, until there's one block beat. Sometimes you may not be able to appreciate the lengthening or it may be not be so clear cut, but if you look at the subsequent bit, there will be a shortening of the PR interval. And this can help you to uh, deduce that this is uh, um, Mobitz type one. Uh, and generally in these cases, it's, uh, the QRS is narrow and the block is often in the AV node. And in Mobis type 2, so in this case, you can see that the PR interval is constant before and after the block beat. Uh, and uh, this often refers to uh, an infranodal block and the QRS, which is escape, which is uh, broad. Now, if we come to a persistent heart block, such as a 2 to 1 heart block, uh, there are, as I mentioned again, 2 to 1 heart block uh, can have the block uh, in the AV node, in the HIS, or in the bundle branches. And uh, there are ECG features that may help us, such as the QRS morphology, whether it's narrow or broad. Generally, a narrow refers to a escape to a block, uh, usually in the AV node or HIS. Uh, the PR interval may also give a clue. A very long PR interval usually suggests that it's in the AV node. Uh, and again, we can see before and after. So what I mean is uh, how it started. If there is Banky bar uh, leading to a short uh, period of uh, uh, two to one block, then again, this is likely to uh, suggest that the block is in the AV node. And you, you can see in the two pictures, the first one has a narrow escape, two to one block, or the second one has a broad escape, a short PR interval when it's conducted, and also an, a short episode of high degree three to one, uh, high grade uh, three to one AV block, which suggests that the block is infranodal. So I talked about some non-invasive tests that can help us determine the site of conduction defect. And uh, generally, exercise and atropine is considered together. They improve uh, AV nodal conduction. So if the block was in the AV node, then we expect exercise and atropine to improve the conduction, while carotid sinus massage will deprove the conduction. However, if the, if the site of block was uh, uh, infranodal, such as in the his or bundle branch, exercise and atropine will actually uh, 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 worsen uh, the conduction uh, 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 was improve the conduction uh, and uh, sorry, the carotid sinus massage will actually improve the conduction while exercise will worsen the uh, uh, conduction. So uh, we have our first polling question here. So maybe time for you to do some uh, exercise. Uh, so in this uh, ECG here, uh, can we have a polling on to see uh, what the audience thinks is the problem here? <laughs> 
Okay. Shall we have the results? Okay, so uh, 43% majority said sinus bradycardia. Some say uh, the other one was two to one heart block. Okay, let's see. Let's see what it is. So it's a bit unfair, I know. Uh, the tracing is not of the best quality uh, and uh, you are not given much time. You're not given before and after. But can I draw your attention? Sorry. Okay, so actually, the P, the P wave is not very visible, uh, except in lead V1. So uh, I would say that uh, it's important to look at all 12 leads. And, and when you see obvious P wave, I think look in between in the T wave to see if there's some hidden P waves. So in this case, you can see that there are, there's a two to one heart block. Uh, and because the PR interval is fixed, so it's a fixed two to one heart block, long, PR interval and the QRS is uh, slightly uh, long lengthened in an incomplete right bundle bunch block pattern. So, so this is a two to one AB block. And if you look at the EPS for this, you can see during the conducted bit, the AH interval is prolonged, uh, but the HV interval is actually normal. And if you look at the block bit, there's the atrial signal with no hiss, suggesting that uh, this together suggests that the block is in the AV node, so resulting in this two to one heart block. Okay, this is another example. I won't pull you this time, but again, this is a two to one heart block, and with carot carotid sinus massage, it improves. Uh, you can see that the, con the ventricular rate increases. So where is the conduction block? So it's actually infrahase, so how do we work it out? You can see that with carotid sinus massage, it improves, so it has to be infranodal, it's not in the node. And, and you can see that the QRS complex is uh, slightly broad, uh, right bundle type pattern, and so it's uh, below the his. So that's how we work out where the site of block is. Final example, again, this is a two to one heart block uh, with a narrow QRS uh, and with exercise, what we see is that from a two to one heart block, the, the PP interval shortens, so the, the atrial rate increases, but the block increases to a three to one heart block. So in this case, uh, how do we work out where the side of block is? With exercise, uh, it improves, so it, is, uh, it, it worsens, so it's uh, infranodal, and uh, because it's a narrow QRS uh, escape, so it has to be in the his uh, uh, where the block happens. Okay, and so if you look at the EGM again this time, uh, you can see that uh, there is a uh, fractionated split his signal during the block beat. Okay, this is a quick summary uh, of what can help you determine the site of a two to one AV block. So the QRS width can help. A narrow QRS is likely to be AV nodal or his, and a broad QRS likely infranodal. The PR interval is very, very long, again, suggesting AV nodal. Uh, if it's very short, then probably infranodal. Uh, okay, with atropine and exercise, if they improve the conduction, then it's nodal. Uh, and in carotid sinus much large, if they improve the conduction, it's infranodal. The next uh, degree of block is third degree heart block or complete heart block. And in this case, we see AV dissociation with more atrial uh, activity than ventricular activity. A and V should both be fairly regular. Uh, there is a ventricular phasic phenomenon, which I will explain in my next slide. Again, QRS can be narrow or broad depending on the site of escape. So you can see that in the top figure here, uh, it again, is an example of uh, uh, infarct pattern. You can see that the escape is a nodal escape. Uh, with a narrow QRS escape, okay, while the bottom figure shows a broad QRS escape, which is slightly ventricular. So the ventricular phasic phenomena is uh, such that there's minor change in the PP cycle length, such that the, the one that contains a QRS in between them has a shorter cycle length than the one that is, uh, does not have a QRS between them. So this is 
uh, this example is uh, commonly mistaken for possible uh, kind of conduction block. But you can see here that uh, the PP interval is actually longer than the RR interval. So you cannot make that judgment, even though there is AV, there appears to be AV dissociation, is actually isorhythmic dissociation. And the problem is actually with the slower atrial rate rather than making a judgment on AV conduction here. So this is a summary flow chart of how uh, we treat uh, AV block. As I mentioned before, you always consider any reversible causes. After that, you may want to consider uh, 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 underlying causes such as neuromuscular disease or infiltrative disease. Uh, and in general, only complete heart block or advanced AV block or infranodal block will go to uh, a pacemaker, such as in this column, but you can see that in uh, first degree heart block and type 1 block, generally uh, there is no indication for pacing except for specific conditions. And in these specific conditions, if there was an indication for pacing, you may also want to consider the risk of ventricular arrhythmia such a, and, and therefore consider an ICD instead of a pacemaker. So I'm going to quickly touch on class three indications. I spent quite a lot of time uh, explaining how to determine the site of AV block. And this is important because you can see uh, it is a class three indication to put in a pacing uh, for uh, patients with first degree AV block, second de uh, Mobitz block, or two to one AV block where the block is believed to be at the level of the AV node, okay? And certainly, especially if they are asymptomatic. And of course, uh, if the uh, block is uh, due to a reversible cause, then again, it's a class three indication. If it's vaguely mediated, generally it's class three. So we move on to the next section, which is the SA note. Uh, and uh, SA note is a bit straightforward. The, diff the, the diagnosis may be, may be many such as uh, sinoatrial exit block or sinus arrest or tachybrady syndrome or chronotropic incompetence. But in general, the management is, is more straightforward. So this is an example of sinus bradycardia followed by a sinus arrest such that there's no P wave. And then the, the subsidiary uh, pacemaker, the junctional escape happens and you can see the retrograde P wave afterwards. Okay, in sinoatrial block, here it's, uh, it's like the conduction block that happens in the AV node, except that this time the interface is between the sinus node and the atrium. And, and so the features are, are also similar. So if there is type one uh, sinoatrial block, uh, there is group beating uh, instead of the QRS, you have root beating of the P. You can see that there's a cluster of P waves before a P, uh, P wave is missing. And this happens uh, in a fixed pattern. Uh, and this may uh, make you su suspect that there is a uh, first, uh, second degree type 1 SA exit block. Uh, if there's a 2 to 1 SA exit block, you can see then clearly there is a drop P wave uh, and the PP interval uh, change from, it, it will become a fixed interval. So you can see that the P is going on and then there's a drop of a P resulting in a two times uh, the PP interval. And this will be quite abrupt. And then in this case will be an example of a tachybrady uh, syndrome whereby on termination of the tachycardia, there is sinus arrest until a uh, junctional escape. Beat. So again, in sinus uh, node dysfunction, uh, the first step would be to rule out reversible causes. And the second step will actually be to correlate bradycardia with symptoms. Uh, if there are no symptoms, then there's really usually no indication for pacing. So asymptomatic patients, even with sinus bradycardia or sinus pauses, uh, probably do not need a pacemaker. Uh, Sinus uh, bradycardia or sinus pauses related to sleep or increased vagal tone, again, 
probably do not need a pacemaker. Finally, we come to the section of uh, conduction blocks. So uh, this is more straightforward. This is an example of a right bundle branch block with its uh, uh, feature on, on, uh, on the picture. Uh, I will draw your attention to the last one here. Okay. Uh, sometimes we see an RSR pattern, but the QRS is actually very narrow. This is usually considered normal. They are not, uh, it's a normal variant rather than considered as a right bundle branch block. Okay, left bundle branch block have a QS or a small RS uh, in B1 with a slurred uh, R in B5. Uh, and uh, this is the typical picture. For you can have uh, incomplete, uh, you can have a left anterior fascicular block, which is shown in this ECG. And the features are actually uh, just a left axis deviation with no increase in the QRS uh, duration. Okay, and in this example, you get a right bundle branch block as well as a left anterior fascicle block and together we can term it as a bifascicular block. So the features will be a right bundle branch block pattern with left axis deviation. Okay, an example here we are showing is a left bundle branch block and then a subsequently a changing to a right bundle branch block. So this is what is commonly termed the alternating bundle branch block. And if you look at the uh, electrograms, you can see that the HV interval is prolonged in these uh, cases and it even more prolonged when there's a right bundle uh, branch block. So in this alternating bundle branch blocks, they often have infrahistin disease and it's a strong indication of pacing. So uh, the flow chart again, if there's a conduction disorder uh, with bundle branch block or fascicular block, uh, block and there's one-to-one -one AV conduction, uh, then we try and determine certain features. Uh, if there is syncope that is suggestive of bradycardia, bundle branch block, and we, if we have additional EP information showing that there's infrahistin disease, then this is an indication for pacing. Or if there's alternating bundle branch block, that's also an indication for pacing. So this is a brief summary of, for the indication for pacing for sinus node disease for AV block and for bifascicular block, which uh, I will not go through. So I think in my last uh, 10 minutes of my, uh, uh, a few minutes of my presentation, I would like to go through some cases. So this is a 48 years old Indian lady uh, who presents with uh, this ECG, uh, no family history, mildly impaired LV function. You can see that there's a left bundle branch block here, pattern with, uh, complete, almost complete heart block. You can see the P waves. And then in a, in a subsequent ECG, uh, there's a right bundle branch block pattern, again with heart block. Okay, so can I have the next polling uh, uh, question? Uh, what is the most likely diagnosis? Okay, can we have the results? Okay, okay, so majority of you went for degenerative conduction disease uh, because that is the uh, most common form of AV block, cause of AV block, okay? However, I think in this case, uh, there are a few things that go against it. Sorry. Okay, so in this lady, uh, she has cardiac sarcoidosis, and in this type of cases, uh, it is useful to perform advanced imaging such as MRI, which shows the late gadolinium enhancement, as well as a PET CT, which shows that there is uh, inflammation as well as uh, the old skull. So uh, 
in younger patients, maybe who are less than 60 years old, who have unexplained uh, advanced or significant AV block, then it may be uh, useful to consider sarcoidosis as a cause. Uh, I think, um, and then in these cases, consideration of CMR or, or PET CT will be helpful. And the reason is because in this lady, for example, uh, uh, it may be uh, and a further discussion on whether it's just a pacemaker or ICD because of a sarcoidosis and impaired LV function. And the second thing would be as she has active inflammation, steroids would be very helpful in these patients. And in fact, for her, we did implant a device. Uh, however, after a course of steroids, her conduction disease actually resolved and she had a normal conduction afterwards. Okay, uh, this is the next uh, uh, question, a polling question. A 78 years old, with, admitted with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and heart failure. Uh, and this is the telemetry which shows that uh, he has tachycardia followed by bradycardia. So uh, just a quick poll. We will just have 10 seconds for this. Uh, what would you do? Uh, Anti-arrhythmic medications? Uh, would you give, her, give him a pacemaker? Or would you do an AF fibrillation or some other form of fibrillation? Okay, can we have the result? Okay, so most of you chose a pacemaker, which is very reasonable in a 78 year old. But uh, because you were not aware of uh, some of the things that I saw, so it's unfair. But uh, if you look carefully, uh, in, in the, within the T wave, there's actually a, uh, there is something within the T waves. And when you bring to the EP lab, there's actually an ectopic. So, uh, so one learning point is in a, significant bradycardia, we look carefully for, and uh, in this case, there is a block atrial ectopic that reset the uh, sinus node resulting in significant bradycardia. And this is happening on a, a constant basis and there's occasions when the P wave and the T wave is, is more apparent than others. So in this case, actually, when we mapped it, it did come from the right superior pulmonary vein focus and by ablating actually by completing the PVI, he has no bradycardia and no, no AF. Okay, my last, uh, I may only have a couple of minutes left, so last two questions. Uh, this is a 25-year-old male referred because his ejection fraction is poor, he's tired. Uh, in terms of the bradycardia, uh, what do you think is the most likely diagnosis? Is it junctional escape? Uh, left bundle branch block, uh, is it idioventricular rhythm or pre-excitation? Okay, can we have the result, please? Great, so most of you got it right, it's pre-excitation. So uh, you could see that that's actually a, a, a very small P wave before each QRS and he's got a parahysin pathway and the treatment for this actually is uh, he was referred for a CRT but we ablated the parahysin pathway and his QR, his, uh, uh, his LV function actually improved and normalized. Okay, I think this may be the final uh, case that I'm going to go through. 89 year old gentleman referred to, uh, to the cardiac clinic because of bradycardia and occasional giddiness. This is his ECG in the clinic. Uh, what do you think is the most likely heart rhythm? Sorry. Uh, again, not a very good quality ECG. Okay, can I have the results please? Okay, complete heart block. Okay, wow. Uh, actually, uh, the truth was it was missed 
uh, and he was sent home with a halter and uh, I'll show you the result of the halter. Okay, so this was the result of his halter and here it was quite clear that there is a degree of two to one heart block and actually when he was vomiting uh, and giddy, it was because he was having uh, uh, polymorphic DT. Okay, so uh, in this case, you can see that uh, there, this, the red arrows refers to the QRS and you have the blue arrows referring to the obvious P wave. But uh, as usual, look in between the P waves, look at the T around the T waves. And actually you can maybe just convince yourself that there is a P wave. So the moral of the story is do not accept poor quality ECG and really look very carefully between two P waves to see if there's actually one hidden uh, in, the, in the QRS. Okay, I think uh, my time is up. Uh, I would like to just conclude that uh, uh, AV block can be determined by the ECG, but you need to go beyond making a diagnosis of first, second or third degree AV block and go on to determine the site of block because that will help you make a better decision in terms of future management. Uh, uh, sinus node conduction abnormalities, I hope I've gone through uh, the ECG features and hopefully the case studies will help full in uh, exposing you to some cases of bradycardia. And with that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wong, for your presentation. Um, Harry, do you have uh, any other uh, comments you wish to add? It was a very concise and well presented uh, presentation and it kept a time which was remarkable and I think everyone learned something. I most certainly learned a few pointers. I may have known it in the past but it's always good to be reminded and I find that some of these uh, generic simple lectures are the best ones that we can listen. So congratulations on a great uh, presentation. Thank you. So um, um, actually in the chat box, uh, I can see there are a few questions. Uh, so we spend a few minutes on uh, answering uh, to quest those questions. The first questions uh, to Dr. Wong is why there is opposite effect of atropine in Subtra and uh, in Frandudo's block? Sorry? Did you see the um, questions? Oh. And um, uh, why there is opposite effects of atropine in subcha and in venudo in venudo block? Subcha, sorry. Uh, yes. So um, atropine. Um, I mean, it's more uh, difficult. But in, as I said before, uh, the impact of atropine and exercise is mainly on the AV node. So if you improve the AV node conduction, uh, if you improve the conduction, then the block is likely to be the AV node. Uh, and if you, the in, it, conduction deproves, then it's more likely to be infranodal. However, atropine also has impact on the sinus node as well, making it fast. So sometimes you get a uh, not a clear cut reading, but in general, uh, atropine and exercise considered together should improve AV nodal block, but uh, worsen the infranodal block. Thank you. And here is the second question, um, which is about uh, what are the causes of irregular RO interval? in complete heart block, except um, when trichilo, uh phases arrhythmia. What is a typical wanky bar? Oh. Uh, in general, if you do have complete heart block, the escape should be expected to be fairly regular. Uh, ventricular phasic uh, uh, response or phenomenon is really only seen in the P waves, whereby the, the PP interval may, be, may vary slightly. All right, thank you. Wow, well, there's uh, lots of questions. And here is another one. How to differentiate between old inferior wall MI and versus LAHP? Okay, uh, 
I, I think sometimes maybe not possible, but uh, I guess inferior wall MI uh, usually results in Q waves in the inferior leads and maybe T wave changes, while uh, left anterior hemi block uh, will generally be show a RS, a small R, deep S pattern in lead three and and uh, in BF with a left axis deviation. Thank you. So um, I think we can go through two more questions. And um, the question is, what is mechanism of worsening of rate after CSM in AV block? Okay, so um, in general, what happens is uh, uh, if you have carotid sinus ma massage, it will cause a AV delay. And if uh, if the block was in front nodal, so you are actually delaying the atrial impulse from reaching the the, uh, the the in front nodal block, and as a result, this delay may actually improve the conduction. Uh, uh, while because you have caused a delay in the AV node, so by increase you are effectively increasing the R, uh, PP interval, so that it may have a better chance to uh, to conduct through the disease uh, in front nodal. Uh, uh, conduction system. Um, right, so uh, one last question is, um, due to the time. Uh, any reason for longer PR for right bundle branch block bit and shorter PR in left bundle branch block bit in alternating oh. bundle branch block? Uh, uh, I'm not aware <laughs> in that case. Uh, so uh, I guess in, in, in this uh, kind of cases, uh, the, the conduction the system is very diseased anyway. Uh, I, I have a feeling in, in that case, it's not just a right bundle. It, it would be a right bundle branch block with a left anterior fascicular block. Uh, uh, if you look carefully at the ECG, which results in an even longer uh, HV internal. All right, thank you. Um, sorry about that for the time, so we have to move on to our next lecture. Uh, next section, um, I'm happy to have a Dr. Harry Mond. Uh, he's an associate professor at both Melbourne and Monash of Universities in Victoria, Australia. Dr. Mond has been performing pacemaker implantation since 1970. So um, now, I would like to pass the time to Harry. Thank, Thank you, you. Charlie. Can you see my slides? Um, can you please uh, share, try to share your screen again? Uh, yes, not yet. Uh, can you click the share oh. screen button? Oh, in the... Yes, come in. Yes, thank you. We can see your screen. Is it a single slide? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. My topic is going to be the electrocardiogram of normal cardiac pacing. It will be divided into two sections. The first is the simple uh, way in which we diagnose the mode of pacing. And the second part of my talk will be a discussion on pacemaker algorithms, uh, which when they are incorporated and programmed on, they cause havoc in the interpretation of ECGs. I'd like to start with polarity. And there are two ways to pace the heart muscle, unipolar and bipolar. For unipolar, there is a single pole on the, uh, on the lead, which is the cathode, and the anode lies on the pulse generated CAM. Whereas with bipolar, we have both anode and cathode 
on the lead and hence the term bipolar. The difference on the ECG between these two forms of polarity lies in the size of the stimulus artifact. For unipolar pacing, we see very large stimulus artifacts for both atrium and ventricle, whereas for bipolar, we see tiny uh, stimulus artifacts, which of course can lead to a misinterpretation by not seeing it and not recognizing pacing. How then do we recognize the stimulus artifacts and hence pacing? You look on the uh, leads V2 to V4 generally, um. because these lie leads lie over the heart over the apex and you can therefore see the uh, it's closest to where the lead is pacing excuse me uh harry sorry for interrupt so um we did we're still on the first live of your first slide of your presentation can you um please try to um share your, your slides again i it's moving normally for me is that a is that a moved? Um, no, it's still on uh, uh, at the first slide of your presentation. Uh, this is Patrick. Uh, I think you click the sh pause sharing button. Uh, try to see that there is a uh, resume yeah. sharing. Then your slide will will go. In. Or can try to stop sharing and uh, yeah. share your screen again. Stop yeah, sharing. Can stop. Yep. And sharing again. And well, I have to come out again. Can you see it now? Uh, not yet. Mm. Maybe it's this one. Can you see now? Yes. Uh, it's coming. Uh, coming, coming. Yes, uh, coming. Uh, this. Can you try to move to another Next. slide to see? Uh, Is it now? Now it's two, two screen. Now it's a two screen. Two screen. Yep. Okay. Yep. Can you change it again to uh, one screen? Is that one now? Yes. Yes. One. Yeah. One. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'll I just it. repeat very quickly. Uh, I started off with polarity and two ways to pace the heart, unipolar and bipolar. And the difference is, lies in the size of the stimulus artifacts, which in unipolar are large and in uh, bipolar are very small. How then do we find the stimulus artifacts with bipolar pacing? And it's best to use leads 2, V2, and V4. And these generally show these small but discrete stimulus artifacts. We now look at the modes of cardiac pacing. And we have a three-letter identification code and a fourth letter, R, to identify rate adaptive function. The first letter is the chamber paced, the second letter is the chamber sensed, and the third letter is the chamber response. For instance, if we take an example of ventricular pacing, VVI, the first letter is V for ventricle, 
and is the chamber paced, sensed is the second letter, and the third one is inhibited. For DDD pacing, we have uh, dual pacing in the atrium, in the uh, first letter in paste, atrium and ventricle. The second letter is also sensed in atrium and ventricle. And the third letter indicates inhibition in both the atrium and ventricle. But what it also uh, denotes is that there is triggering of the atrium uh, causing the ventricle to then fire off after an appropriate AV delay. So the D there not only looks for inhibition of the atrium or the ventricle, but also for triggering of the ventricle. Ventricular pacing can be divided into three forms. Note that I'm using unipolar pacing to highlight the stimulus artifacts. For VOO pacing, we can see that the stimulus artifact progresses continually through the tracing and taking no notice of the underlying native or intrinsic rhythm. VVI, which is by far the most common form, you can see now that the intrinsic beat is sensed and there is a cycle, uh, a repetition rate where it, there is a compensatory pause before it goes on to the next ventricular pace beat. With VVT pacing, the stimulus artifact now lies within the QRS as all the energy is placed into the QRS because of this system uh, was used when we were unsure of sensing and inappropriate uh, sensing of the uh, artifact could turn off the pacemaker. Note, however, that there are two other beats here where the stimulus artifact actually lies at the very beginning and the QRS complexes look like an amalgam of the triggered of beat as well as the paste beat. These are called fusion beats. Have a look at this tracing and you'll see how uh, we describe fusion. Firstly, we have two beats here which are ventricular paste. We now have two beats here where there is intrinsic rhythm, sinus rhythm, first degree AV block and a bundle branch block. And between them, we have two beats that I call progeny that look like their parents. The first one looks like the ventricular paste beat and the second one looks more like the intrinsic beat. Note that their P waves are emerging from this as the pacing rate gets a little, as the sinus rate gets a little faster. Fusion beats occur when there is insufficient time to sense and inhibit the next pace beat. Have a look at this line going through and you can see how the T wave gives you a clue as to the presence of ventricular fusion. The intrinsic beats have a negative P a T wave, the uh, VBI paste beats have got a very tall one and ventricular fusion beats have an amalgam of those two. What about atrial pacing? Again, there are three types, AOO, AAI and AAT. Let us have a look at atrial pacing and how we determine uh, this rhythm. Firstly, we must identify an atrial stimulus artifact. Secondly, we need to see a P wave. And third, we need to see an AV delay before the QRS occurs, which is a non-paced QRS. We can't always confirm atrial capture on an ECG or a halter monitor. And therefore, we shouldn't necessarily say atrial pacing unless we are sure about it. In this example, we can see 
the atrial stimulus artifact followed by a ventricular pace beat and between it is the AV delay. But we see no P wave. It may be there, but we can't be sure about this and we need to consider high degree, high threshold exit block in the atrium, or maybe this is atrial fibrillation with undersensing and therefore regular atrial stimulus artifacts. Another thing about atrial pacing is of course, it does not sense in the ventricle. Here we have atrial pacing with AV conduction. And now we see two ventricular atopics. And within those ventricular atopics are the stimulus artifacts, which are clearly atrial, because they time with that. Obviously, two ventricular atopics without retrograde conduction will not be sensed by the atrial channel. And we have to uh, realize that this is not pacemaker malfunction. Dual chamber pacing, there are at least four forms of dual chamber pacing. And the fifth one here, of course, is OOO, which is not pacing at all. Let us look at DOO. There is no sensing, or it's asynchronous pacing, and A and V stimuli continue unabated. Now we can see a ventricular atopic here, and the atrial and ventricular stimulus artifacts. We can see P waves, which uh, have been marching uh, through the uh, stimulus artifacts in a way in which you can see there is no atrial sensing. Today, we do use dual uh, DOO pacing in patients who are to have an MRI, for instance, and who require pacing because of underlying uh, sinus bradycardia as well as maybe complete heart block. DDD pacing, we can see in the first complex, there is atrial paste and ventricular paste, and this is the first uh, letter of DDD. The second is atrial sensing and ventricular pacing. And the third is, and we can see an atrial fusion beat here. Similar to a ventricular fusion, it's an amalgam of both the atrial paste and the atrial sensed beat. The thing about DDD pacing, as I stated earlier, we have both atrial and ventricular inhibition, as well as atrial and ventricular synchrony with the A triggering the V. Now, if that doesn't occur, we call this DDI pacing. DDI pacing is valuable in patients with sinus bradycardia and paroxysmal atrial tachyarrhythmias. We can see in this example, there is atrial pacing and ventricular pacing, which accounts for the first D. We can see uh, that there is, although we actually cannot see it, there is atrial and ventricular sensing. These P, the P waves that you see are actually sensed, but the uh, atrial sensing fails to provide AV synchrony and the ventricular pace rate therefore remains at a fixed rate unless there is rate uh, adaptive pacing. This type of rhythm disturbance could be looked at as being AAI and VVI. And when we put them together, when we have an atrial tachyarrhythmia, the ventricular pacemaker does not follow at a fast rate. VDD pacing is simply atrial sensing and no pacing followed by ventricular pacing. In this latter, uh, ECG, you can see that there are two ventricular atopics. The first is, uh, has an interval followed by a P wave and therefore AV synchrony is retained. The, following the second uh, QRS atopic, you can see that there is now no 
wave, and therefore after a set uh, cycle length, there is ventricular pacing. In other words, if we have sinus bradycardia with BDD pacing, we effectively have BVI pacing. The second part of my talk is how to recognize pacemaker algorithms on the electrocardiograph. The first I'll talk about is hysteresis. Hysteresis was a function that was originally incorporated into pacemakers even before there was rate, even before there was programmability. Simply put, we have a pacemaker set at VVI 50 beats per minute in the presence of atrial fibrillation. What happens then with hysteresis is that the sensing period is longer than 1200 milliseconds, or in this case, 40 beats per minute. And I should say that's an error there, sorry. Uh, and we have, therefore, hysteresis is a function where we try to encourage ventricular sensing. However, it may lead to significant pauses. The next algorithm is ventricular safety pacing. With, with dual chamber pacing, a late ventricular ectopic may fall within the AV delay. And if this was sensed in the normal way, it could inhibit ventricular pacing. If it was in fact an artifact, then asystole may occur. Most of the pacemaker companies now have incorporated safety pacing, whereby when the, when the ectopic beat, as can be seen below, uh, is within the AV delay, the AV delay is shortened to about 100 milliseconds. This is still normal function and should not be in interpreted as malfunction. Pacemaker mediated tachycardia. With dual pa chamber pacing, if a retrograde P wave is sensed, it may set up an incessant tachycardia, or what we call pacemaker mediated, ta mediated tachycardia, which goes along very fast, close to the upper rate limit. Here is a demonstration of this with atrial sensing and ventricular pacing. There is a sensed junctional ectopic, which then sets up the incessant tachycardia. In times when we first started doing, uh, doing, doing implanting dual chamber pacemakers, this was a problem which would occur continually and we could never get rid of it. And we actually had to do surgery to remove the pacemaker if there was no programmability. Today, pacemaker companies have algorithms to prevent, to detect, and to correct pacemaker-mediated tachycardia. Here is a typical example. We can see an ECG with a tachycardia. Atrial sensing and ventricular pacing becomes faster. And this is because there is atrial failure to capture, which allows retrograde conduction in the next beat and sets up the tachycardia. Companies now have a, a number of ways of either preventing this or treating it, but in general, what they do is that the pacemaker has to determine that this tachycardia is truly due to a retrograde P wave and not due to a supraventricular tachyarrhythmia. Then it sets, allows it to pace for a set period and then it extends the PVAR and we have, and therefore the retrograde P wave is now refractory and it aborts the tachycardia. I'd like to talk about a little more complicated situation, which is minimal ventricular pacing. On Holter monitor of patients who have got pacemakers, this is becoming a very significant 
issue in that there is misinterpretation of the ECGs. And I'd like to show you some examples. With minimal ventricular pacing, the pacemaker is set to pace AAI and in the presence of a failed AV conduction will convert to dual chamber pacing DDDR. There are then scheduled conduction tests and if the uh, pacemaker is now shown to have, sorry, if the rhythm is now shown to have AV conduction, it reverts back to AAI. All the companies have got these algorithms and they have got long and complicated names. They are designed along different ways of, of treating the, um, uh, particularly with the scheduled conduction tests. And all of them have an offset, meaning that these, uh, in the presence of failed AV conduction, the pacemaker will revert from AAI to DDDR. Whereas with scheduled conduction tests, the AA, DDD pacing can revert back to AAI. Let us show you some examples of this. The simplest one and the one most commonly seen is managed ventricular pacing with Medtronic. This ECG gives an example of a failed AV conduction. There's atrial pacing and ventricular sensing with a, first, with a long AV delay. The next beat is no AV conduction. The pacemaker recognizes this and then allows the next P wave to emerge, atrial pace beat to emerge, and then it paces after an 80 millisecond delay. This happens once and therefore it just goes back to what it was before of A pace, V sense, AAI pacing. So this has no mode conversion. However, mode conversion or mode offset will, convert, will occur and going from AAI to DDR in this situation. Here is the same situation, atrial pacing, ventricular sensing, and then there are these two non-conducted P waves here, atrial pace beats, and following this are two beats with atrial pacing with a very short AV delay of 80 milliseconds. There is a count then, there is a one, two, and then the third one here, it conducts normally. And the fourth one is a failure of conduction. If there are two out of four failure to conduct, the pacemaker then reverts to DDD pacing, atrial pacing, ventricular pacing at the programmed AV delay. And we just have a ventricular ectopic beforehand. This is mode conversion. What about the scheduled conducting, conduction tests? This is an example of where it goes from dual chamber DDDR to simple AAI R pacing. The pacemaker uh, rhythm is shown with atrial sensing and ventricular pacing. It extends the AV delay here to 400 milliseconds and there is a, a spontaneous QRS emerging. And as a result of this, the pacemaker reverts back to AAI pacing. This is a success. Let's have a look at one which wasn't successful. And this is the ventricular intrinsic preference by Abbott. And you can see the pacemaker is pacing with an uh, ventricular ASVP delay of 280 milliseconds. The test, the scheduled conduction test, extends it out to 440 milliseconds. And there is still no uh, intrinsic QRS. So this is regarded as a failure 
of a scheduled conduction test. And as a result of this, it just remains atrial sensing, ventricular pacing like it was before. So throughout these halter monitors, you see these extensions of the atrial uh, AV delay and you wonder what's going on. These are scheduled conduction tests. The last one I'd like to talk about are the auto threshold algorithms. These are short periods of forced ventricular pacing that you see on an ECG or a halter monitor. During these periods, the AV delay shortens and for each beat, the voltage is reduced until there is failure to capture. There is then a backup pulse of at about 100 milliseconds. Most of the companies have similar type algorithms, but there are two basic differences that you can see on the ECG. Some of them shorten the AV delay to something like 50 milliseconds, whereas others just shorten it by a small amount. Let us have a look at one, uh, the Abbott one, ventricular auto threshold algorithm where the AV is shortened to 25 milliseconds. And you can see on this ECG, there is atrial sensing and ventricular sensing almost all the time. And suddenly there's a short run of ventricular pacing. And in fact, there is atrial sensing before it, which is only 25 milliseconds in the AV delay. If one looks at that last one here and highlights it, you can see that there is a longer AV delay here because there is failure to capture. And then at about 100 milliseconds later, there is a high thresh, higher voltage spike emerges. And this then is the termination of the algorithm. The threshold has been uh, determined and the pacemaker then adjusts the voltage output. Just to finish off with a Medtronic one, it only shortens by 30 milliseconds. So we have a, an, a situation where we have atrial pacing and ventricular sensing of 220 milliseconds. It shortens by 30 milliseconds and now there is forced ventricular pacing. And you can see on the bottom of the tracing how it, uh, the algorithm progresses along with, uh, short, with reducing voltages until the threshold is determined. It finishes and it goes back to the atrial pacing ventricular sensing at 220 milliseconds. I'd like to uh, thank uh, APHRS for allowing me to give this lecture today. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Dr. Mon, for your uh, presentation. So, uh, seems we already have a questions uh, here. I want to ask you um, why we have to minimize ventricular pacing? Is it to prevent heart failure because of pacemaker syndrome? Why? retrograde P can trigger tachycardia at PMT? Okay, the first question was, um, why do we need to minimize pacing? Clearly pacing has been shown, ventricular pacing, particularly at the apex of the right ventricle, has been shown to result in reduced left ventricular function and heart failure, and sudden death, atrial fibrillation. And as a result of this, we, I shouldn't say sudden death, it's death and atrial fibrillation. As a result of this, for many years, pacemaker companies have been trying to determine how we can prevent uh, atrial pacing, sorry, ventricular pacing when we do not need it. And these are the algorithms that have been developed. Each one is unique. Each one gives a characteristic appearance on the ECG and can cause a lot of confusion. The second question I believe had to do with uh, um, what causes a retrograde conduction. 
V and PMT. This is usually the settings in the pacemaker, as, uh, which, are, which is the uh, pacemaker uh, PVARP, the pacemaker ventricular atrial refractory period, or the other factors are atrial uh, ectopic or atrial high threshold exit block in the atrium. Both of these can then set up that the next ventricular pace beat has got retrograde conduction to the atrium, which is then sensed and sets up the tachycardia. Thank you. And uh, here is another question. How to differentiate uh, non sustainability from auto threshold checkup in Holter? So, okay. How, how to differentiate between the minimization uh, ventricular pacing and for threshold. It's, it's a, a complicated ECGs. For those who are interested, heart rhythm, uh, I have submitted a paper on, uh, on this to heart rhythm recently. It is now online and it's on ventricular uh, minimization uh, pacing. The second one, the algorithms that uh, um, used for threshold testing, I'm in the currently in the process of writing that one up as well, because we really do need to teach people how to recognize, right, how to recognize these algorithms on halter monitors and not cause confusion as to whether there is pacemaker malfunction. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, 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 let's move on to the third uh, lecture of today. So, uh, uh, Harry, I leave it to you to introduce uh, Dr. Lim. Our third speaker today is Dr. Toon Wei Lim, also from Singapore. He's an electrophysiologist at the National University Heart Center. He completed his training in Sydney, Australia, and Ottawa, Canada. Way. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Professor Mon. Um, I have to say it is a, oh, I need to share my screen. Um, could um, you, uh, Dr. Mon, could you please uh, stop sharing? Yes. Stop sharing first. Or um, Patrick can help. Okay, I'll share my screen now. Yes, can see your screen, thank you. Start the slideshow, thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you to APHRS and to Abbott Education for the opportunity to, uh, to follow on such distinguished panelists. Um, um, and it'd be a hard act to follow on uh, Professor Mon's talk. I will, um, talk about pacemaker troubleshooting today. Um, and it kind of overlaps with uh, uh, Professor Mon's talk, uh, but I'll, I think we have some uh, different slides uh, to, to talk about. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge where my slides come from. Um, all the unattributed slides uh, and ECGs and images are either my own or courtesy of uh, APHRS, Abbott, Medtronic, or my good friend, Dr. Sui Chong, uh, Xiao Sui Chong. Um, so we'll just carry on. So. <clears throat> What's the, uh, I thought I'd start with kind of like a simple approach to troubleshooting a pacemaker. Um, and in my mind, um, the way I do this is, first of all, you need to think about what you need to do for the patient. Um, firstly, of course, uh, ensure the hemodynamic stability. The next thing actually is probably an ECG, followed by a chest x-ray. Um, and then finally, eventually, you need to interrogate the device. So the next thing you actually need to do, if it's not your own patient, is actually to identify the device type and your vendor. Often, uh, my emergency colleagues are kind of flummoxed by that. And I shared this very, very nice paper with them. Uh, this was published quite a few years ago. And it, it, it's a paper in hard rhythm that basically shows the basic shapes and sizes of devices that were, uh, that were used. And there is a very nice electrogram, although some of these devices are no longer in use, uh, 
some of them, a lot of them are still existent uh, and the basic shape still remains the same for each vendor. And knowing which vendor it comes from is important because you need that to figure out how to, um, how to interrogate the device. So this is often the first step uh, in the unknown device, shall we say. So how do I approach the uh, pacemaker ECG uh, in our patients? The way I do that is um, hopefully quite simple. First question to ask is, is there pacing? Um, and to tell that you need to, I, and just then I think it was uh, mentioned in Professor Mon's talk, is whether there are pacing spikes. Are there pacing spikes and are they appropriate? Um, are there spikes where there shouldn't be spikes or, and are there spikes or where there no spikes where they're supposed to be? Once you've seen a pacing spike, you still need to ask the next question is whether there is capture. If there is no capture, um, then there obviously is a problem. Uh, but if there's capture, you also need to figure out whether which chamber is being captured, is it the atrium or the ventricle? Um, and of course, finally, whether the P wave or the QRS morphology is appropriate for that type of pacing. Um, and finally, the last thing you need to know is whether the, whether the pacing is appropriate or not. And you have to ask questions like, is the rate what the pacemaker is set at? Is that an appropriate rate for the pacemaker to be pacing at? Is there an AV relationship if there's a dual chambered uh, device? Um, and whether the AV relationship is appropriate, whether it's one-to-one, -one, uh, and whether the AV interval is correct and is a logical thing. So that last bit requires some understanding of pacemaker timing. So once you've got that, then ECGs like this uh, become less daunting. So this is an ECG that I picked up um, from my trove of ECGs that I collected when I was a, when I was a fellow. And we'll come back to that later. Obviously, there's a lot of pacing spikes going on, and then there's some that are not paced, but they're still QRS. Uh, so how do you interpret this ECG? Sometimes the pacing spikes can be quite small, and you can see it in this, that there are some small pacing spikes there, but on other leads, they are quite large. So you need to look around to make sure that uh, you have all, all the pacing spikes are, are there. So, so the next thing, you want to know is whether there is capture or not. So capture is defined as when there is electrical stimulus from a generator box and it captures or causes a depolarization and contraction of the myocardium. So to see that, you need two things to happen. You need to see a pacing spike and you also need to see that pacing spike followed closely by a P wave or QRS. And of course, you need to know whether where that lead is uh, to know whether that's appropriate or not. So here are some simple examples of, of pacing and capture. Clearly, there, is, there are pacing spikes and there are QRSs. Um, so the way you interpret that is, first of all, you look for where the pacing spikes are and whether there's a QRS that follows that. And clearly, this is fine. Next, week, there's another pacing spike and there's a QRS. Uh, and noting that all these QRSs look the same. And finally, you have a pacing spike, which is not followed by QRS. And so obviously that, that is a problem. So these beats have capture and that beat has no capture. So this is a very um, a basic concept that we need to understand. And so you would sometimes see long stretches of pacing spikes followed with no QRSs and that clearly is an issue with a pacemaker. Um, and in this case, um, you will see that there's a junction, there's a ventricular escape rhythm that follows after that. Sometimes you will still see QRSs uh, but in this case, you need to understand what is going on. So down here, you will see clearly there's a P waves happening here, followed by a pacing spike, but nothing happens after the pacing spike. Instead, you have a, you have a very, um, you have a, a long delay before you see a QRS. Um, so this is clearly a problem with, um, with, with the pacing, um, with, with, with the loss of capture, because the ventricle is, the ventricle of the QRS occurs a long uh, time after the pacing spike. So this is what you will see, this is what you'll expect to see uh, when you have a loss of capture. So the next slide is again, um, another ECG of a, of a pacemaker. And you know it's a DDD pacemaker because um, at the end of this slide, you'll, at the part of this slide, you'll see that there are actually two pacing spikes. And the fact that they are so close together will tell you that this is probably a, an atrial pacing spike and this is a ventricular pacing spike. What's interesting is as you come along this ECG, uh, you'll see that at the beginning, uh, 
there are intrinsic P waves followed by a pacing spike followed by a broad QRS. Um, so this happens consistently, which will tell you that there's atrial sensing followed by atrial synchronous ventricular pacing. However, what happens here? Presumably the pacing rate, the, the sinus rate has dropped down below the lower rate limit of the pacemaker and an atrial pacing spike has come in. However, the thing to note is that although there is a pacing spike, it's a completely flat baseline here. Uh, granted that it is sometimes very hard to see P waves from a pace electrogram, um, it is useful uh, to notice this as well because this would be very strongly suggestive that you have loss of atrial capture and that there's something wrong with the lead. Fortunately, in this case, the patient's ventricular lead is still capturing consistently and it's unlikely that uh, this patient is in danger as a result of that. Uh, however, this is certainly something that you need to fix. So what are the common causes of failure to capture? Um, so in terms of early failures, there will be things like lead dislodgements, as you can see in this x-ray down here. Um, clearly the atrial lead and the ventricular uh, atrial lead has, has really retracted um, and is no longer in its implanted position. The ventricular lead probably is still in position, but that probably needs to be checked as well. Um, and then in, in this, and, and the, other, the other thing are things like when the pacemaker lead has perforated the ventricle or whether there's a loose set screw um, because the, the pacemaker screw wasn't screwed in properly. Um, and rarely also things like where there's too much air in the pocket, especially if it's a unipolar pacing system. In terms of late failure, there are things like scarring at the electro uh, myocardium interface. And of course, lead fracture and lead insulation failures. Um, and the x-ray up here will show you where there's a lead is completely uh, broken off from the, uh, where it's connected to the uh, lead, uh, to the pacemaker, um, as well as things like battery failure. And of course, there's also metabolic and drug effects. And there's a list of drugs that uh, commonly increase pacing thresholds and cause loss of capture. So um, next thing we'll talk about is uh, sensing. Um, and the reason sensing is important for correct functioning of the pacemaker is that it helps you determine if there's intrinsic rhythm and is necessary for demand pacing, which is how most pacemakers, or in fact, nearly all pacemakers are set up these days. Um, and to make sense of sensing, uh, you actually need some understanding of timing as well. Uh, the reason for that is you need to know whether um, the pacemaker has sent something correctly and reacted appropriately to that, or whether it's failed to sense an event um, and, and inappropriately responded to that. So there's two concepts in uh, failure of sensing. One is under sensing, and this is where the pacemaker misses a P wave or an R wave that should have been that should be sensed, um, and as a result, there will be pacing despite intrinsic activity, and this pacing will be inappropriate. The other concept is over sensing, and that's when the pacemaker mistakes extrinsic electrical activity for intrinsic uh, cardiac event. Um, and th in, in that case, uh, the pacemaker will pace even though it should not be pacing. So here's an example of um, under sensing. And what you'll see as we follow along the slide here is that there are pacing spikes with the QRS, pacing spike with the QRS. So, so far, so good. What happens here though is that there is a P wave followed by a QRS but straight after that, a pacing spike goes in. This would suggest to, to, to you that this pacing spike is clearly inappropriate. In fact, this is quite risky, the fact that it's coming on the T wave. There's another intrinsic QRS followed by another pacing spike. And again, you'll see that the interval from the QRS to the pacing spike is much shorter than the V pace interval, suggesting that this is not an appropriate pacing spike because the device has failed to sense this QRS. Um, Later on then, beyond that, then you see again, there's a pacing spike with the QRS, a pacing spike that comes very shortly after a QRS, and then it repeats the pattern again. What you'll notice, of course, is that the V pace intervals are completely regular across this whole strip. So this is consistent with under sensing, because it's, it's basically the device is pacing at VVI 60 without any regard to what's going on in the heart. So therefore, the pacemaker has failed to see the intrinsic beat and doesn't pace uh, doesn't pace um, appropriately. Okay, so what about um, this pacing strip? 
So again, this is an interesting pacing strip. Um, what you'll find is if we take it, so first of all, when you look across the strip, obviously there are all kinds of different patterns, but there are patterns where there are two pacing spikes and one pacing spike. Um, and so clearly something uh, odd is going on, especially because it's quite irregular. The other thing you'll notice is that there are P waves as well, which are on the sense. So this P wave is not sense at all and is followed immediately by the first of the paired pacing spikes. Uh, which usually this pa first pacing spike, if it's a pair pacing spike, then the first pacing spike is usually the atrial lead. And clearly this is pacing shortly after a P wave and has not sensed the, um, the P wave. Shortly after the a, a pace, then the V pace follows that and there is a successful capture of the ventricle. So that's fine. So what happens here? There is no first spike before the ventricular pacing spike. So therefore the device must have sensed this intrinsic P wave here followed by a pacing spike after the appropriate AV delay. After that, there's another P wave, which is not sensed and not paced because there is no pacing spike after that, as you see uh, like here. So therefore, and then this pattern then repeats itself. And now, now there's a pacing spike, which actually appears to capture the, the atrium followed by a ventricular pacing spike. So what this shows is that this is intermittent uh, under sensing of the P wave. Um, and when you have under sensing like that, it leads to um, excessive pacing and inappropriate pacing at times. So what are the possible causes of undersensing? Um, usually this is things like where the cardiac signal is too small, either due to some issue with the lead or some issue with the myocardium where the lead is implanted. It could be related to lead failure, either an insulation break or fracture, or the sensitivity setting has been set too high. Um, in other words, the threshold of sensing has been set too low. Um, those are some of the common issues um, with the, sorry, the, the threshold for the sensing is set too high. And so the, the, the device is not actually sensing the, 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 the intrinsic cardiac activity. So what about over-sensing? When you have over-sensing, what happens then is you will tend to lose pacing. So in this electrogram example, you will see that at first there is some pacing going on and that seems to be appropriate within an appropriate uh, pacing interval. Um, there is some sensing of an intrinsic activity, but soon after that, there is a long pause before the next pacing spike goes on. And that's because other than sensing these electrical activity, the, the intrinsic electrical activity, as you can see by the, by the annotation marking down here, the device is also sensing stuff that doesn't exist. And in this case, this is probably sensing of the T wave. And so when you have sensed activity here, then it inhibits the pacing of a demand pacemaker and the pacing spike is greatly delayed. And so this is what we call over-sensing. Uh, and you can tell that by looking at the intrinsic channel marker um, even and where they're sensing in spite of no activity. So what are the common causes of over-sensing? So things would be like lead polarity, um, I, when you have unipolar um, sensing, it's more likely to cause over-sensing because of uh, myocardial, um, sorry, because of myopotential interference and also from intrinsic um, electrical activity uh, causing uh, EMI, electromagnetic interference, or there could be a problems with lead integrity, or otherwise your sensitivity setting is set at too low a threshold. So we come back to the first couple of ECGs that I've shown, and I hopefully I can use uh, my fairly simplistic approach to try and explain to you what's going on with these ones. So clearly at the beginning of, this pace of, of the pitting on the strip, you can see that there are tiny V-pace spikes, okay? And this V-pace spikes are followed by QRS that looks exactly like these QRSs here on the, other, on the other end of the screen where there's a pacing spike. So clearly this is normal atrial activity followed by an appropriate ventricular pacing. So this is normal A sense V-pace. However, what you'll notice though, is that there are a series of missing gaps here where although you see an intrinsic P wave, you don't see a QRS following that. And in particular, uh, and in particular, you don't see a QRS in spite of the fact that there are pacing spikes here that you can see on these leads. And so clearly these, there is appropriate output of pacing. However, there is no capture of the, QR, of the, of the ventricle. So hence the diagnosis for this ECG is a failure of ventricular capture. Um, 
what about this one? So this one, I have to admit, um, I only have the ECG and I, I don't no longer have the interrogation, but uh, let's work through this together. And maybe Professor Mon can also share some of his thoughts on, on this ECG. So again, just like the last one, you will see that there is a P wave that's not preceded by a pacing spike. So this is intrinsic atrial activity. The morphology looks a little bit odd. Um, it's not clearly positive in the inferior leads, but it is still clearly intrinsic atrial activity because it precedes the pacing spike. Then there's a pacing spike followed by a QRS, okay? But then something funny happens here where there is no pacing and another a complex happens, followed then by uh, resumption of ASENS D pace activity after that again. What you'll find is that, um, so the question is why is there no pacing here? Um, because there is an early intrinsic P wave and a QRS and sensing is appropriate because there is a delay from here to the next pacing spike. So what's unusual about that is that if you look at the AV delay here or the PR interval rather, it is actually fairly long and clearly longer than the PR interval from the pacing. So therefore, why isn't there any ventricular pacing despite the long PR? As I said, I don't have interrogation, but I have two couple, couple of theories about what could be happening. This P wave looks a little bit different from the other P waves that have been tracked by the pacemaker. And it clearly comes at a short interval as what the other ones are doing. So this is an atrial ectopy. However, clearly this is sense because there's no pacing after that. Um, <clears throat> So why isn't, there, uh, is, why isn't there a pacing spike after that? One possibility is that the atrial ectopy had come in during the PVAP. The argument against that is, though is that the PVAP is tremendously long if that's the case. Um, it is like nearly more, more than 800 milliseconds and that's an unusual setting to put on the pacemaker. So the question, uh, so what I, makes me wonder is whether in fact there is under sensing for some reason of this atrial ectopic beat and hence the ventricle is not paced. Uh, the ventricle is not paced. However, the ventricle is sensed and that would then delay your next atrial pacing interval. Um, and before that atrial inter pacing interval times out, an intrinsic activity actually comes in and then you get a sense V pace again. So that's what I think is going on. But ultimately you'll need to still interrogate the device to figure out what's going on. So finally, in the last uh, part of this, I'm gonna go through some issues about timing. Uh, Professor Mons already covered a lot of that, and I'll just cover a couple of things uh, that were not covered, uh, and, and also go into a bit more detail about uh, PMT. So this is actually a halter tracing of a 24-year-old patient of mine with complete heart block after a mitral valve replacement. Um, and he had complained of palpitation and dyspnea on, on exercise, um, and so he was put on, on a halter monitor, and this is what we saw on the halter monitor. Um, Clearly he's an active 24 year old and you can see that his sinus rate is actually quite fast. Uh, however, what you'll notice is that not every P wave is actually followed by QRS. And in fact, the other interesting thing that happens is that the PR interval progressively prolongs until there is no PRS. And so this is, as you probably all know, pacemaker wanky bark. So why does this happen in a pacemaker? You think of wanky bark as being caused by AV nodal delay but basically what happens is that the A sense V pace interval gradually prolongs until, because the V pace comes in so late that the next atrial activity or sinus beat um, falls into the, 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 falls into the PVAP um, and is then considered refractory and no pacing follows on from that. And as such, you have this pattern that looks exactly like a uh, Wenke bark pattern. Um, and the reason for that is this, when your, when your atrial or the AA interval is, um, is above your upper tracking rate, which is the, max, the, the, the shortest interval between, um, uh, between uh, sequential V pace impulses, that's limited by your upper tracking rate. Uh, what happens is that when the a, next ASENSE event comes in, the next V pace event is pushed out uh, beyond your sensed AV delay. And so there's a gap that opens up beyond that. Um, and that's because the pacemaker is not able to pace at the same rate as your AA interval. Uh, 
And as such, this gap prolongs uh, progressively until a sensed atrial event will fall within the p valve, and that is refractory and no longer paced. However, when that happens, your upper tracking rate resets, and then the next uh, event either can be an A-paced or an a sent event, and then followed by a, a uh, then followed by a B-paced. And so that would be a, a recurrent thing that would happen um, with, uh, with, um, with uh, pacemaker Wenke Bach. Usually it's not an A-paced, usually it would be an A-sense event, uh, but not always necessarily an A-paced event um, when, the, when, the, when the rate is fast enough. Um, if, however, your A-sense uh, events are even faster and actually shorter than what we call the TARP or the total atrial refractory period, which is the sum of the sense AV interval with the post ventricular atrial refractory period called the TARP, then what happens is that every other atrial event will fall within your PVAP. And when that happens, you'll get two to one behavior instead. Um, and so this is what happens as your rate gets faster. Unfortunately, I don't have an ECG of that, uh, but here is a, um, here is a, a electrogram from uh, interrogation showing exactly that. And what you'll see is that there's an A-sense event followed by an A-refractory event, an A-sense event, followed by an A-refractory event. So only the A-sense events are followed by ventricular pacing and the A-refractory events are not. So this is two to one, uh, um, so this is two to one um, um, AV um, pacing uh, behavior in the pacemaker. What about uh, this ECG? So when you see an ECG like this, we've kind of been through this uh, just in, in uh, Professor Mon's slides. But the thing to take home is that there are P waves going on somewhere and there is a pacing spike followed by QRS. So therefore this is pacing at a very fast rate. And in this case it's pacing about 115 beats per minute. Clearly this is in DDD mode because there's atrial sensing and ventricular pacing. Uh, but the pacing is very fast rate despite of uh, the base rate being 60 beats per minute. Um, usually patients are quite, quite, can be quite symptomatic from that. And this is what we call pacemaker mediated tachycardia. We kind of talked about it briefly, but this is what happens. Um, when, um, when usually it's triggered off by a, by a ventricular ectopic or junctional ectopic, what happens with this is that the ventricular ectopic would conduct back over the AV node um, and is then sensed by the, by the uh, atrial lead which then tells the ventricle to pace, and then that pacing then goes back up with the AV node again, and this kind of circuit then um, commences. Um, and the way to think of it is that this is actually some kind of atrial ventricular reentrant tachycardia, where the retrograde pathway is the uh, native uh, AV node, and the integrate pathway is actually the um, pacemaker itself. Um, and so uh, as uh, as was mentioned by Professor Mon, this used to be a real problem, but these days there are algorithms that do this. And there's a few ways to, 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 to do that. One way obviously is to put a magnet over the device, which then disrupts the loop. Another way is to extend the PVAP, um, which will then uh, cause the, the sense A to fall into a refractory period and is no longer sensed. Uh, modern devices also have uh, the ability to extend PVAP after a PVC. So if it senses a PVC, it can automatically extend the PVAP um, and then uh, will help you inhibit uh, PMT. And of course, there's also what we call PMT algorithms, which is this. So this is a patient of mine. And as you can see, um, this is an A-PACE V-SENSE, A-PACE V-SENSE going on quite happily. Then what happens next is a V-SENSE event and then another V-SENSE event. This first V-SENSE event causes this to be refractory. Uh, does cause conduction, which is refractory, but the second V-sense event causes um, an A-sense event because now it's conducted back, but with a greater delay uh, over the AV node. And so this is now sensed. And, and once this is sensed, then but this is a CRT, obviously. And then what you have is biventricular pacing following that. So A-sense by V-pace, A-sense by V-pace, and this carries on. What the device then figures out is that this is pacing at a high rate close to your upper tracking rate and triggers off a PMT response. The A-sense event is rendered refractory by temporarily extending the PVAP. And then following that, then an A-pace event follows on and then resumes normal pacing again. So this is how most pacemakers um, these days are able to terminate PMTs if they see that. 
But of course, obviously this is not a permanent solution. And in cases like CRT patients, for example, uh, can it reduce the amount of biventricular pacing? And there's an issue in these patients. So in summary, I think the ECG can actually be very helpful for troubleshooting pacemakers, uh, especially when you're not able to interrogate the device immediately. Um, this is particularly helpful for my emergency colleagues who are able to tell a lot of what's going on before we actually in, in interrogate the device. Um, understanding of device function and, and, and programming is actually essential to help you um, uh, troubleshoot just using a pay, pay ECG alone. Um, just be mindful that device and lead failures can be intermittent at times, uh, but ultimately you'll need to interrogate the device to be able to definitively diagnose system malfunction. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Lin, for your presentation. Um, Harry, do you have any uh, comments to add on to this uh, presentation? Again, it was a, a nice presentation, uh, clearly showing the abnormalities. Uh, the one ECG that was troublesome, I'm not very help. I can't help you anymore on that one. Uh, so we'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now, uh, Dr. Lim, we uh, there are some uh, questions in the chat box. So um, the first one, first question is, Manet won't, I think this is a comment, won't disrupt BMT if the device is an ICD? Um, most devices, when you put a magnet on them, will go into a different pacing mode. They will either go into a VOO or DOO mode. Um, so in that sense, once it does that, it will terminate the um, what, well, it will uh, do that uh, and terminate the, um, the PMT, at least temporarily. And once you take the magnet off, then you'll take it off. Um, putting on the magnet obviously also will in interrupt uh, tachycardiotherapy for ICD patients as well. Um, but I, I believe in most, dev most devices, um, putting in the magnet will also change the pacing mode. Um, there's another question here about why there was no by B pacing during CRT PMT during A pays B cent? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, this, I, I suspect, is going to be, uh, it's about this one, and why immediately after there's A pays, there's, a, there's, a, there's only a V cent and no, not by V pays in this case. Um, I believe this is because uh, for some reason after this, as you'll notice, the uh, PR interval is actually shorter here. Um, and, um, the, the PR interval has actually shortened in this patient. Perhaps I, I'm, this might be just intrinsically shortening, and this is now shorter than the a cent, the um, cent AV delay in this case. Obviously, this is not ideal, um, and it's not ideal for a patient who has um, who has a CRT device that you like to have pacing 100%. I see. Um, okay, so thank you. So. Um, I think that, that there's lots of uh, um, uh, participants that leave a message whether they can get your slides and uh, the recording. So um, for the recordings, because uh, so next week we will have another uh, section, uh, we will announce it um, uh, after next Friday in the sections. So I'm happy to see that. Um, um, so uh, Dr. Lim has answered most, for most of the questions from our audience. And then, oh, there's one more question. Um, Dr. Lim, does any magnet edge to disrupt PMT? Um, the magnet needs to be strong enough to be detected by the pacemaker. Um, the, um, so um, usually it, uh, most device companies will have their proprietary magnets. Um, however, um, there are a lot of neodymium magnets lying around um, in many places these days. Um, and that is, um, that, is, um, that is possible to do that. And in fact, um, some high-end, um, there's been studies where high-end um, earphones uh, with their neodymium magnets have inhibited uh, pacing and inhibited ICD function as a result of that. Um, so yes, yeah, so there's a, lot of, um, that is, there's a lot of possibility for that. But there's a question here about why P wave is not visible after the pacing spike, and that is often um, just because the P waves are quite small um, with the pacing spike and you may not actually be able, it might be quite a isoelectric uh, flat P wave. Um, and so therefore you don't see it clearly. Okay, thanks a lot for your explanation. Uh, so I'm happy that I can see it, uh, Professor Ching Chi Kung, uh, Professor Ching is our module director for this uh, ECG uh, program. Um, Professor Ching, would you like to say some things uh, for today's uh, program?
เออเออใช่ใช่ Hi everybody! Uh, it's a, it's great to to be on on this program. I want to thank first uh, all the speakers, Dr. Harry Mond, Kelvin uh, Tunwei, for those excellent talks. You know, I learned uh, quite a few tips and tricks on interpreting ECGs, uh, EGMs, as well as uh, X-rays. Uh, I think we really have to learn to read these ECGs, um, you know, during our course of work, so that we can pick up. The abnormalities quickly. So I want to thank all the speakers for the wonderful talks, and for for Albert to work with uh, APHRS on this educational uh, webinar. There are more to come, and I look forward to more exciting uh, and educational session. And once again, thank to all the speakers. Over to you, Jeremy. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Cheng. And before we finish, uh, uh, I would like to pass the time to. Uh, Henry, um, to say a few words uh, and to for and advertise for next week program. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Jeremy. I'd like to finish up now with thanks once again to APHRS and to Abbott, and particularly to Jeremy Yu and Patrick Ho, who've really worked very hard to put this symposium together. I also like to thank my fellow speakers, and of course, not to forget the audience. For without you, we have no one to talk to. Remember, next Friday, June the sixth, uh, there will be part two, interpreting the ICD electrograms and basic ECG for CRT. Our speakers are going to be Dr. Daniel Chong of the National Heart Centre Singapore, and Dr. Vanita Arora of the Max Hospital in Delhi, India. Thank you all, and keep safe in these troubled times. Thank you, thank you, all our speakers and everyone for joining today. I hope I can see you tomorrow, and I wish you all stay safe and healthy. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>